To open up Premiere, press Command Space on your keyboard. It will open up Spotlight Search, type in Premiere, and press Enter. This will open up the app. Once it loads, you'll be brought to this welcome screen. Press New Project to get started. This will open up this menu. You're going to want to name your project, and then click this Browse button to pick your save location, wherever that might be. Once you have it, click the Choose button down here. You can leave these general settings the way they are, but click Scratch Disks and make sure that everything is set to same as project. This will just make sure that your auto saves and audio files will all be kept in the same spot. Once you've done all that, you're ready to begin editing. First thing you want to do is go up to File, and then scroll down to Import. This is how you're going to get all your footage into the project. Navigate to the folder where all of your footage is saved, and select what you want to import. Now a quick tip, if you want to import multiple files at once, if you click the first file and then scroll down to whatever the last file you want to import is and hold shift and click, it will select multiple at a time. Once those are all selected, you can click the import button right here and all the files will be in your project. To actually start editing the footage, you're going to want to drag a clip over to this gray box and this will create your timeline. You can continue to add media to your timeline by dragging over files from the media box onto the timeline. To zoom in or out on your timeline, you can use this gray bar at the bottom and click and drag. And to navigate your timeline, you're going to want to use this blue slider right here. Now over in this box, there's a collection of helpful tools that can be used throughout editing. The most important are the selection tool, razor tool, and pen tool. The selection tool is the most basic tool, it essentially does exactly what it says, so you can select things and then move them around. The razor tool can be used to split your footage or audio. This can be helpful if you need to remove a certain section, you can do that by cutting it and then clicking and deleting it. You can also trim media with the selection tool, when you have it selected, hover over the edge of your footage or audio, wait for the mouse to turn into this little red icon, and then click and drag to where you want the media trimmed to. There's a few tools for the timeline itself. The most useful ones are the Snap in Timeline tool and the Link Selection tool. Snap in Timeline will do exactly what it says it will and will snap things together. Link Selection will make it so your footage and audio that is together will be selected together when it's turned on. If it's turned off, it will only move one at a time unless you have them both selected. Now let's move on to audio editing. There's a few ways to do this. The most basic way and most widespread is to right click the audio file and click audio gain. From here you can adjust the volume of the entire audio clip you just selected. If you want it to be louder, type in a positive number and if you want it to be quieter, type in a negative number. Once you have what you want, press OK and it will update. If the audio level isn't as consistent, this is where the pen tool comes in handy. So for an example, let's say I want to take this big audio peak and make it more consistent with the rest of the clip. I can use the pen tool to click the edges of the peak, and then add two more dots inside of them, and then click and drag to lower the volume. The steepness of this line will indicate how fast the audio change will occur, so if you want it to be more gradual, make the slope more gradual. If you want it to be instant, you can do a straight line down. Unlike with the audio gain method, the actual audio level displayed on the timeline will not change, but the audio will be different, as you can see if we look over at this audio indicator on the side. If you want to set up voice recording, you can right click on these grayed out microphone icons. Once you have this open, click voice over record settings, choose your source, then click close and you'll notice that the microphone icons have turned white and are now clickable. Once you click the microphone, you'll get this countdown. Once it reaches one, you can start recording your voiceover. To stop recording, just press the spacebar and your voiceover should appear in your timeline right where you recorded it. If it doesn't, it might end up with the rest of your media, so you'll just have to drag it over into the timeline where you wanted it. Next, I'm going to go into how to adjust the size and position of your footage. So let's say I want to zoom in on these XLR inputs in this clip. I can click the clip, and it will open up this window up here. By clicking Effect Controls, you'll see all of these different options. Position has two sliders, one to move it left and right, the other to move it up and down. Scale is the size, so the bigger the number, the further zoomed in it will be, the smaller the number, the further out it will be. Rotation will rotate your footage. 
and opacity deals with how visible it is, so the higher percentage, the more visible it is, the lower the number, the less visible it is. If you need to reset these to default, just click the reset parameter button for whatever category you need to reset. You can also make use of these to essentially animate your footage. This can be done with the usage of keyframes. Keyframes are basically markers that store the effects at a given time. You can create them by clicking this stopwatch icon, and add additional ones by pressing these circle icons. The video will automatically transition between the variations of effects you've made. For fast transitions, put the keyframes close to each other, and for more gradual changes, distance them out. Now those aren't the only ways to change your video and audio. If you go over to the effects folder, you'll see a bunch of folders for audio effects and transitions as well as video effects and transitions. If you click the arrow next to whatever folder you want to open, it will release a bunch of subfolders which can also be open to access the particular effects and transitions. To use transitions, click and drag them to where two pieces of media meet. If you want just a simple crossfade, you can just right click that spot and then select apply default transitions and it will automatically put a crossfade there for you. Same thing can be done for audio as well. For effects, find whatever effect you want and then drag it onto whatever footage you want to use it on. If you go back to the effect controls menu, you'll notice that there's now a tab for whatever effect you just dragged on. There you can adjust settings specific to that effect. For an example, the level of this poster effect. Now there's one very important video effect I want to mention. It can be found in the color correction folder, and it's called Lumetri Color. So this effect is used for color correction, as you probably guess. There's a lot to play with with this effect, but you can just focus on basic correction. So here's what all of these individually do. Temperature will deal with how warm or cold your footage is. You can think of it as how orange or blue it is. Tint is the same thing except with pink and green. Exposure is basically brightness. Contrast is how much of a difference there is between the dark parts of your shot and the lighter parts. Highlights target the brighter parts of your footage and shadows will target the darker parts whereas whites and blacks will target exclusively the whites and the black parts of your footage. And if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll notice the saturation slider, which will deal with how colorful your image is. The higher the number, the more vivid your colors will be, whereas at zero, your footage will just be black and white. Color correction is a very critical tool when it comes to making sure that your footage is consistent with its lighting and colors. There is one other video effect I want to bring up. This effect will help you with chroma keying, which might be more commonly known as blue screens or green screens. To demonstrate this, I'll be using some random green screen footage I have of my friend. You can find this effect by navigating to the keying folder and selecting Ultra Key. So once you've dragged the effect onto the footage you want to edit, go to the effect controls and find the key color. You can use this eyedropper tool to select the exact color you want to remove from the shot. For whatever reason, it seems as though it's glitching out a bit on the latest version of Premiere, so you might just need to do this manually and eyeball the color. You'll know you've done this correctly if the green disappears from your shot. Now you're going to want to open up the Matte Generation tab, and you're going to see a bunch of these settings. The best way to go about this is just mess around with the settings until the background of your shot is entirely black. There's no weird discrepancies, it's not gray like that. And you're going to want to make sure that the person or object that you want to be, have isolated is entirely visible and not cut off. If the person or object in frame is cut out or there's a few random splotches left over, you can use the matte cleanup tools to adjust and fix that. Eventually, your shot should look something like this. Now to insert a new background, the first thing you're going to want to do is click the footage in the timeline and drag it up a row. Now drag whatever picture or video you want as the background underneath that footage that you just raised. Adjust the length if necessary, and just like that, you have a new background. Now this is a good time to mention rendering. You'll notice that there's this red bar on the timeline. That means if you try to play back your footage, it's going to stutter and lag and it's not going to be smooth at all. So, to fix this, you're going to want to render your footage. This can be done by navigating to the Sequence tab, and then selecting Render In to Out. Once the rendering is complete, you should be able to preview your footage without any issues. Let's say you want to add text to your project. You may have noticed this text tool down here in the toolbox. You're not going to want to use that text tool. It's not as much customization, it's a little bit harder to use. 
So you're going to want to go to File, New, and then Legacy Title. Name the title whatever you want, and then press OK. To be greeted with this box, you might need to resize things so you can actually see all of the tools and have a better workspace overall. There's plenty of things here to mess around with and customize your text, but once you have it positioned how you want it, you can close the window and find the text with the rest of your media. Once you have it, drag it on top of wherever you want it to appear, adjust its length, and you're good to go. Once you're finished editing, it's time to export your final project. Before you do anything, make sure you save your file, and that's something you should be doing regularly. Anyway, once that's out of the way, go to File, Export, Export Media. This will bring you to this menu right here. From here, go to the Format tab and make sure that H.264 is selected. Then click the blue text next to Output Name, pick your save location, and then type in whatever you want to save the file as. Once you have that, click Save. You don't have to worry about any of these settings here, so just go ahead and click Export. And once the export is finished, you'll be done.